All right, Norma, 1929, Greenville, Texas. Yes, sir. But you left there when you were very young, right, for Fort Worth? Yes, actually, we were living in Commerce, Texas, where my daddy had a small general store or department store on the square. What was the name of it? Abramson's store or something. I, I don't remember. It was Ab Abramson and... Um, when he got his younger brother over from uh, the old country, he made him a partner, and it was Abramson Brothers. And so, but I don't really remember. Now, do you remember what year this was or when it was? Yes. Um, well, Daddy didn't come to America. He was from uh, Lithuania. Right. And uh, he came from an extremely impoverished family and uh, he had help coming to America from a uh, sister who had settled in Connecticut and she was on a she had a dairy farm and she had enough money to help him come over and um, he came over in 19. 20, 1919, 1919. Now, now I think it was not, 1919. Why did he not settle in Connecticut? What, what brought him to Texas? Well, that's another interesting story. He had a, an uncle named Isaac Heiligman who came to Oklahoma from Russia in the late 1800s about 1899 or something like that, and lived and traded with the Indians. Hmm. And he had some sort of a store, I think. And I don't know what all he did, but um, he had a little bit more money, and he promised to my father that if he came to uh, Oklahoma, then um, he would uh, help sending him to medical school, and my dad wanted to be a doctor. So he financed, this uncle financed the trip from Connecticut to Oklahoma. And when he got there, uh, he had to work in his uncle's store, and his uncle decided that he couldn't afford to send him to medical school. But um, so daddy worked in his store, and uh, became very friendly with the principal of the Hugo High School, who later became the president or the chancellor of the University of Oklahoma. And he liked my father very much, and he offered my father a chance to go to the University of Oklahoma, and uh, he could board and room with them in their home on the campus, you know, at Oklahoma University. And um, that's how much he liked my father and admired my father, who was very, very smart, who had been educated at the gymnasium in Russia, and he spoke perfect English. And uh, you, you would never have known that he was uh, an immigrant. Mm -hmm. by his speech. So anyway, Daddy at that time was still sending money back to the old country, to his parents and his sisters and brothers who were still in Lithuania. Did he ever see his family again? No, no. Do you know if they made it through the war, World War II? No, most of them were slaughtered. And I have photographs of the family and letters from uh, one of his sisters who uh, survived uh, Auschwitz and, and a couple of camps. She and a, a sister survived. Yeah. And so, um, but all the rest were, were slaughtered. Where'd your dad meet your mom? That's so funny. Um, mother's family came to the United States, but waited for my grandfather, who came first, to save enough money to en en enable them to have a boat trip, you know, right. a ticket for the whole family. 
So they were, they were from uh, the Ukraine. Nikolaev um, in the U Ukraine. And um, there were a lot of people from that area who probably they were related to all of them, you know. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them, for some strange reasons, settled in Oklahoma, in the Oklahoma Territory. It wasn't even a state at right. that time. And um, they were related to the Rudman family, who were, became very prominent here in Dallas. And um, then they had other relatives that were from there, and they suggested that my grandfather move to Oklahoma from Russia. And so um, he had to work very hard. He opened a pawn shop, and he did really well. He traded with the Indians, and um, he was able to build a very nice house, and I have a picture of it on a postcard. It was made into a postcard. And um, he lived, they lived right next door to the Heiligman family, which was my father's uncle's name. It was his mother's brother, this Mr. Heiligman, right, right. Isaac Heiligman. And so my father um, came to Oklahoma, to Hugo, Oklahoma, and um, he understood that there was a Jewish family next door, very nice family from uh, Russia. So he had no compunction about just n not even knocking on the screen door and walking in. And mother said it was around the time of Passover, and my grandmother had just laundered the curtains, mm -hmm. and my mother was hanging them up. And she was only about 14 or 15. And she said that she was in her bra and panties, hanging the curtains. And in walks my father. And he decided that's who he was going to marry. <laughs> he liked what he saw. He liked what he saw. And um, so that's what happened. Mm -hmm. It was interesting that my father made extra money by going in a horse and buggy to various little towns where there was a Jewish population, mm -hmm. and he was able to uh, aid in the uh, Friday evening services right. or at Passover. He was able to conduct some services because they didn't have a rabbi, you know, on hand. Right. And, and word got out in the area that he, he was available. Yeah, and so he got to know a lot of people in um, now, did your, grand, did your grandfather ever tell you stories about the Indians, how they accepted, you know, you know, all these people coming over from Europe? Yeah, you know, I, I didn't hear him uh, say too much about it because uh, he became uh, deaf or hard of hearing. But he did tell us that um, he had no problems with them, and he once sold... Um, a bathrobe, you know, those Indian uh, robes that um, had many colors in them, uh, and they made them into bathrobes. The American uh, non-Indians made them into uh, bathrobes. Right. And so he said that this Indian chief walked in one day, and he sold him a bathrobe, and the Indian chief used it as an overcoat. <laughs> he said it was an overcoat. But um, now, my great uncle, Isaac Heiligman, um, lived a lot with the Indians and learned to speak their language. Mm -hmm. And um, he was well thought of, and uh, they had no problems did, at all. Did they ever say how that they lived? Did they? Become part of the society when the um, when the settlers were coming in. Did they mm -hmm. did they mesh with them? Did they become part of that society and shop and build stores? You know, in the towns with them. Well, there wasn't a lot of shopping. You know, uh, whatever there was, it was more like trading. Right. Uh, there was a lot of uh, 
a Ku Klux Klan uh, mm -hmm. and anti-Semitism. But uh, my mother never complained about the teachers in the school. And uh, the children teased her when she first came to school there after traveling from Russia because she couldn't speak English. Right. So uh, This was the regular town people, not the Indians. Though. The regular town people. I don't think the Indians at that time uh, were given any education, you know, right. through the American. Right. It wasn't even Americans, you know, they were just a territory at that right. time. Okay. So uh, the thing that uh, my family uh, seemed to resent on my mother's side was uh, the fact that my aunt was supposed to be a um, cum laude graduate of the high school. And, um, but she, my grandmother particularly, was extremely religious and orthodox. And so they didn't go to school on the high holy days, you know, especially Yom Kippur. And so they didn't give my Aunt Sarah the honor of uh, being the first in her class in, in getting that uh, graduate honor. And because she was absent on Yom Kippur. Mm. And so uh, they still resented that, you know. Mm. But the teachers, I have a, a copy of a um, term paper that my mother wrote in high school, and she talked about our teachers and how wonderful they were. Now let's talk about you. You know, what? when do you really start remembering? Was it when you guys moved to Fort Worth, you know, as a little girl? What are your early remembrances? I remember being three or four years old in Commerce, Texas. And um, I remember the house, and I remember uh, we had these Irish males, they were called. They were toys that uh, you could pedal them, mm -hmm. and they moved, you know. And I got on mine, and I thought I'd go see my daddy and mother. At, mother worked along with him in the store. And I, I was only about three or four. And I remember thinking that I was going to go up the street and, and go meet them and see them. Um, and we had a, a what they call nannies today. Uh, she was a, a, a nurse, mm -hmm. and uh, she took care of us. And her, we called her Mama Bankhead because she took care of us so much. She was like a second mama, and she was the a relative of uh, the famous Bankhead family. You know, like Tallulah Bankhead was a great actress, and uh, there was a Senator Bankhead that her family was related to, but they were from Tennessee or some other southern state. And um, we also had uh, black girls helping in the house, and and they we I also played with the little black children whose fathers were working on the cotton farms. Mm -hmm not far from our house in Commerce. And um, I have pictures of them, too, with us. They, they helped us build a snowman. We actually had snow sometimes in Commerce. Yeah, yeah. Where did you go to high school? Pascal High School. Tell me about high school life. Well, it, it's a very fine school. And uh, I had a lot of good friends, mostly Jewish. There wasn't much intermingling, you know, with the non-Jewish children at that time. It's changed completely since then. Um, but we lived in a Catholic neighborhood, and um, most of my friends that I played with were uh, either Catholic or Baptist, and my parents were extremely liberal. And uh, they really wanted me to go to school at the Catholic Academy called Our Lady of Victory. And um, because I always wanted to go to school in the East, and I wanted to go to uh, Wellesley or Radcliffe or something, because I really loved the seasons, you know. Right. 
And uh, I took piano from uh, Sister Mary Albertine and Sister Mary Catherine from the time I was around, I'd say seven, until I graduated high school at age 17. Yeah. The, um, your folks, did they keep the store in commerce after you moved? Oh, no. No. Uh, they moved briefly to uh, St. Louis, of all things, because my grandmother and grandfather and her sisters and brother's brother had moved to St. Louis. They didn't want to stay in the small towns. And uh, for some reason, oh, they didn't come to Dallas initially because uh, my grandparents had moved to St. Louis. So my mother wanted to be with her people. So uh, we moved there and lived there about four years. But at that time, the pollution was very, very bad. This was in 1935. We lived there from 35 to 39, or 38. And, um, and I was about 9 or 10 when we moved back to uh, Texas. What, and what did your dad do then in Fort Worth? That's what's very interesting. He uh, was probably intending to open another uh, shop, where, you know, clothing store, uh, because he uh, didn't get to go to medical school. So what happened was a friend of my mother's, oh, by the way, my mother went to college. She went to Oklahoma College for Women. And uh, my grandfather couldn't pay the tuition so, because he had lost a lot of land. He had invested in some oil land, and um, he couldn't keep paying the taxes, so he lost a lot of money. And um, so Oklahoma College for Women offered her a chance to come to school there uh, if she would work. And so she got a job working in the kitchen I guess cooking, and also she said there were no sliced bread loaves in those days. Mm -hmm. So uh, she got a job uh, slicing bread and cooking, and she worked her way through three years at Oklahoma F College for Women. And um, then she married my father because he was getting anxious for her to, to get married. and. He was about seven or eight years older than my mother. So he was ready to marry. Right, right. Yeah. And so what did they do in Fort Worth? Oh, so what happened was that one of the Jewish families, I don't know if they met him in Oklahoma or if she was a friend of my mother's from college, but they came to visit my father and mother. And... Um, he was a traveling salesman for the Helen King's uh, Helene Curtis right. Industries. Uh, and his sister, I think, was an executive with Claire Oil, the hair dye company, mm -hmm. hair coloring. And he began telling my father uh, about the beauty supply business. And um, my father liked the idea of not having to change products every season, and women always wanted to look pretty and have their hair curled or, or you know and colored and uh, to wear makeup. And he said that he liked the profit that they make. Um, for example the beauty shops used to, I don't know if they still do, they would buy pints of nail polish and then put them in small little bottles and sell them individually for a lot of more money, you right, know. Right, sure. And Helene Curtis um, also developed the cold wave and Daddy was in on that. He um, was able to try to start in that business, he liked it better than the dress business because 
there's no style or season with beauty supplies, you know. So one day, my mother was, the, he began buying beauty supplies, and we couldn't even afford a store. So I remember having beauty supplies in the back bedroom of this house on South Henderson. And one on, when we first moved there, we were on South Jennings, and the beauty supplies were in a back bedroom. And my mother was the chief cook and bottle washer and the secretary and everything else while my father went out and tried to get the beauty shops to buy from him. Right, right. And there were a lot more well-established beauty supply companies here in Dallas, and he had a lot of competition. Uh, and what happened was that um, Helene Curtis was actually owned by a Jewish family, and they heard that there was a poor, struggling Jewish guy in Fort Worth who was trying to sell beauty, beauty supplies, excuse me. So the president of the vice president of the company came knocking on the back door of our house, and mother answered the door, and she was ironing clothes and answering the telephone for the beauty shops, you know. And uh, this Mr. Gitwitz was his name. And he was one of the officials of Helene Curtis Industries. And the, those industries like it very much if they can control how much a supplier buys and everything. So they didn't know who they were dealing with, though as, as, as much as they need, my parents needed that company. Uh, mother was very tough. She said, uh, well, we'd, I'm sure my husband would be interested, but of course it's up to him. And she said, um, of course we would want um, complete control of the supplying of the drugstores and beauty shops like Neiman Marcus, and we would want you know, complete control. In other words, they would have to buy from from them. From them. Yeah. So uh, that was all arranged, and my father agreed to buy from them. And uh, that's how I learned about paying your debts immediately. The minute he was able to open a, a small store, on West Magnolia in Fort Worth, and um, I learned how he said that you immediately pay your debts. The minute the merchandise arrived by truck, he would send them a check so that they could not dictate to him how much he should buy and uh, right. things like that. And he never owed them any money, you know. so. My brother actually learned a lot about business. He used to go down there when he was very, very young and listen to my father talk to the salesmen or to customers, and he would sweep the floors and, you know, and just listen. And uh, by the time he was 16 years old, my father put him in charge above the, the manager of the store. Um, and left him in control when mother and daddy wanted to take a vacation, you know, for a few weeks. Carl was in charge. Now, was Carl older than you? He's 13 months younger. 13 months younger. Okay. But he was the boss. <laughs> now, did you work at all in the store with the family? No, I didn't. I should have, but I didn't. Yeah. Now, now, let me ask you, how did, um, uh, and, and eventually, did your dad's business continue to grow? Yes. And did they open up stores? No, they did. They, they, just, they just supplied for the, the uh, supplies, right? Yeah. And um, what was the name of that business? Southland Beauty Supply. Southland Beauty. Supply. Yes, okay. and um, what happened was that he was extremely kind and uh, good to the beauty shop 
operators right. and owners. Um, and I remember seeing him sit up quite late at night and try to figure out how many bobby pins this woman should buy for her store, but how much could she really afford, right, you know, right. uh, things like that. Um, and then uh, Helen Curtis uh, developed the coal way. We didn't have those electrical right. machines anymore that, that used to sit in our living room right. on Jennings. And... Um, then World War II started, right. and there were, there were camps around uh, Fort Worth and Dallas, and Arlington, uh, there was our Grand Prairie, there was the Naval Air Station, or some sort of a naval station, and Camp Walters, Army bases. So you sold to them too? No. What happened was, the government began recruiting women for the WACs, the right. Women's Army Corps, and then the officers' wives came in. As a matter of fact, our next door neighbors were two flyers and their wives in, in one house that we had. Um, so some government representatives came and evaluated uh, you know, what they would need. And they went to the different beauty operators and said, now who would you suggest we get the um, beauty supplies from? We're going to open some beauty shops on the bases mm -hmm. and we want to know who you all would recommend to, right. to get our supplies from. They said, oh, without a doubt, Mr. Abramson. And that really got us started. Now, World War II time, were your parents aware of what was going on with their families back in Europe? I think so, but Daddy didn't discuss it with us, really. And I was still quite young, you know, at that time, nine or ten, when uh, Pearl Harbor right. was attacked. And, uh, of course, Poland was invaded in '39. And um, I'm sure my parents were quite worried, but I don't know if they really knew the extent of right. the damage. Now, now, after high school for you, did you go on to college or did you go to work? Yes. I went to uh, the University of Texas for two years, and I really um, wanted to go where it was colder climate. And they didn't have any air conditioning in the early 40s, and, you know. and. It was really hot down there, and I always wanted to go to school in New England. I loved uh, colonial history when I was a kid, and um, so I went to school in Boston, and I um, entered uh, Emerson College, and um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. But one of my professors wanted me to study speech pathology and communication disorders. And so um, I had no idea that I would really like it. But um, he knew I wasn't the smartest one in the class, but he thought I was um, a, a kind of original in my approach to the patients, you know. And I would say the word patients instead of clients because uh, most of my training was done in uh, Mass General Hospital and uh, Harvard Children's Hospital. And, uh, and I always worked in hospitals, it, clinically, in speech pathology, in speech pathology yeah. right. So you made that a career? It was a career, and it, it paid off because I had to support my son, too. So um, I uh, was on the staff at Baylor Hospital. Here in Dallas. Here in Dallas. I was one of the first that Baylor hired. They didn't really, at that time, accept speech therapy too much. Right, right. You know, but uh, Dr. Cruzen, uh the chief of physical medicine at um, Baylor 
recognize the need for it, you know, and how important it is. And uh, then his wife, who was a doctor at uh, Parkland Hospital, and Dr. Kemp Clark, the neurosurgeon at uh, the University Medical School, Southwestern, uh, they hired me to work also at Parkland. And I, I had a private practice, too, you know. So. And you're retired now, though. Yes, thank goodness. <laughs> um, now, you were married twice, once to Donald F., who was mm -hmm. shoe manufacturing, and you had uh, one son from that marriage, uh, and Robert Kleinman, who helped build the uh, trains out at the airport. Well, uh, designed them. I, I don't understand exactly what it was, right. but I know that that was his job, to right. help develop the, the train uh, system. Now, your brother Carl wound up as an attorney. Yes. And, and your son became an attorney. Yes. He kind of followed in his uncle's footsteps. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. What was the happiest time in your life? When I was in school in Boston. Tell me a little bit about your involvement in the Jewish community in Dallas. I wasn't really involved in the Jewish community too much in Dallas. I was really busy working. I really, you know, tried hard not to have my mother have to support us as much as she right. did. Right. Uh, but uh, I had a lot of friends, and um, a lot of my friends that I was really close to had passed away. You were out, but you were involved with the Holocaust Museum, weren't you? Oh, yes, absolutely. I became... Uh, very interested in it, and uh, my brother had studied a lot about it, and he never suggested that I emphasize it or study it, and uh, it just must have been through osmosis or something. You know, he would tell me some things about different battles. He was always interested in strategy and tactics and right. intelligence work. Um, so, I always liked history anyway, so I became very fascinated with it, and so I took some brief course here that they offered <clears throat> and became a, a docent. And uh, I began interviewing uh, some of them, too, some of the survivors. And I have done extensive research overseas, particularly in Holland, and a little more in France, and um, very interested in writing something about one of the uh, survivors. So you were a docent at the uh, Holocaust Museum for about 20 years. Yeah. yeah. Off and on. So you have a lot of information. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a lot of reading I did. That's great. Um, in your lifetime, was there an invention that came along that you went, wow, how did we ever get along without that? I don't know. I think I just took it as a matter of course. Yeah, yeah. You know, what I'm thinking is, how did we get along like we did in the 40s and 50s with uh, cell phones right. and, and, and uh, computers and things like that? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Now in your lifetime, you've lived through so many momentous occasions. You were a young child when World War II broke out. Yes. Uh, of course, the Vietnam era, President Kennedy assassination, the moon landing in 69 for the first time, something good. Of course, the tragedy of 9-11. Was there something on the national scene that stood out that you go, I know exactly where I was the day it happened? Well, I'll tell you something interesting. I had a government traineeship um, for giving speech pathology uh, or speech therapy to veterans at the Veterans Hospital in Washington, D.C. It was during the time of Kennedy's um, tenure. Mm -hmm. It was 1962. And um, I started noticing the Kennedys when I was in school in Boston. Right, right. And I was about 19 when I was a junior in college. And um, so I kept paying attention to the politics, you know, in Boston, which were really interesting. And um, I started noticing this young guy, and I thought he was really something. And um, so I always sort of had a crush on him. Sure. 
And um, so I was delighted that I was going to get to live in Washington a little while. My mother babysat for my son. He was at that time older. And um, they were going to uh, have a ceremony where President Kennedy places the wreath on the tomb of the unknown. Right, right. And that was in November of 1962. And I decided I was going to take off from work and go see him, you know. And I did. And did you actually get to meet the president? No, no. no. I should have, because at that time I noticed that the security was quite lax. Right. I noticed that. Sure. And um, I remember... Um, his face was very sunburned. His hair was very, very blonde. I think they had been in Florida, and his hair had gotten real blonde. And um, I always looked at men's shoes, and I wanted to see if, if men shine their shoes or things like that. So I looked at his shoes, and I noticed that his uh, feet were very long and narrow. I just noticed these crazy things, yeah. you know. And it was a rather cool day and kind of misty, but he didn't even have on a, a coat. He just had on a suit jacket, you know. And uh, little John John was with him, and John John was uh, prancing in front of him, and he was just paying attention to the, his son. And I remember... Um, one of the generals was on his right. And I, for years I remembered the general's name and now I don't remember it. And then some other generals who I wasn't familiar with, or officers, were on his left. And he placed the um, wreath on the tomb. And um, then the crowd, there wasn't a big crowd, right. large crowd, but uh, he was to give a speech in an amphitheater next to this right. ceremony. And um, I didn't listen to the whole speech. I think it began to rain a little bit. It began to get kind of cold, too. So then I left. But I do remember that. And then I was uh, in Washington 10 days later, of course. And I uh, was at the funeral. And I uh, saw John John come out with his mother and sister. And I saw Jacqueline Kennedy uh, get John John a little signal to salute. Wow. Right. And I saw that. Yeah, yeah. This was 1963. I think you had mentioned 62, but it was November of 63. Was it 63? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's wow. when it was. What advice do you have for the next generation? Well, I'm very disappointed in uh, they don't read very much. And a lot of them like these Kindles or whatever you call them. And um, I like to be able to turn back a few pages and, and get something, information that I might have missed or you know thought about. And um, I like to hold a book. And I like to hold a newspaper. And, um, and not only that, but I don't think that they're encouraged to read a lot. And um, I think a lot of times the parents uh, don't encourage them when they're younger. Right. And I think that that's how you get a child to really pay attention in school. Well, thanks for doing this today. Oh, you're welcome. You did a great job. Oh, thank you.